round table, and it is my pleasure to have you here this evening. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm afraid we don't have a, uh, a St. Patrick's Day themed talk this time. Instead, we're going to have one of my friends and colleagues from the Antietam Battlefield Guides join us tonight to talk about our book, Faces Union Soldiers at South Mountain and Harper's Ferry. Um, Joe Stahl is a dedicated guide and historian. He has been collecting CDVs, mm. Carte Vistas, for, oh, what, Joe, decades? <laughs> Mid-80s? <laughs> oh, Mid-80s, okay, several decades. <laughs> uh, and he has a very large collection that he has been developing into a series of books, the Faces of Union Soldiers series. And it's been my pleasure to assist with him. You'll notice my name is on there as well. But Joe is going to be taking point with the discussion this evening. Now, CDVs, for those of you not familiar, Carte Vistas are paper images. They're mass-produced paper images from just before the American Civil War that really caught fire during the war. Yep. We have an example here. We also have a number under glass in the back, and we'll, of course, be blowing up some big ones on the screen as well. Uh, these images were usually taken in groups at a time. The cameras would oftentimes have four lenses in them so they could produce multiple images at once. And you would buy them in groups. Oftentimes you would have groups of 12 at a time. And so these were essentially, as Joe likes to say, the playing cards or the baseball cards of the day. Um, folks would collect generals, they would collect politicians, and of course they would pass these out to their friends and comrades in the ranks if they were getting an image of themselves. We also <laughs> see them utilized as calling cards and gifts quite a bit. But I would like to turn things over to our speaker now, Joe Stahl. Oh. I'll add one other thing. Not all the time, but predominantly, these are also advertising because on the back, the photographer put his Studio address, how do I buy more of them? <laughs> yeah, and so at the beginning of the war, a lot of times they're blank, but as the war went on and the photographers got smarter, they kept getting more and more elaborate and complete. One of the strangest ones I've found so far is actually the photographer had an agreement, which probably means he had, was splitting the profits with, with a hospital. So as the wounded soldiers were coming, he was taking their picture and advertising that he was a photographer for the hospital on the back of his. Did the soldier carry one of those with him? Not usually. I don't think so. They're too fragile. Um, what they would, what you, there are a large number of. They would buy them, you know, when they were on furlough in Washington D.C., and then they'd mail them home. And so there are a lot of these you see sometimes with the Civil War dealers and Civil War shows, and it says dead letter office. And unfortunately, a lot of times, since it's in the dead letter office, there's no ad, there's no name, there's no regiment, it's just a picture of a soldier. And so you can't do much with it as far as research, which is what I want to do. Okay? Yeah. So... I'm going to, I'm left-handed, so I'm going to stand over here. We're talking about the Maryland campaign. Who doesn't know about the Maryland campaign here? Never mind. Not this crew. They go pretty well. <laughs> I don't uh, talk about the uh, four locations on the north. People tend to forget about that one up there. And then, of course, there's this thing down here called Harper's Ferry. So we'll be looking primarily at Frosttown Gap, Turner's Gap, Fox's Gap, Crampton's Gap, the four gaps of South Mountain that were fought over, and then, as Joe said, Harper's Ferry. And what the, the organization of the book is, a number of images from soldiers at each of those. So each of those is a chapter. So there's five chapters in the book. And, of course, it's McClellan's Chasing the Confederates. So with each chapter, you get this nice map, courtesy of Brad Gottfried, who's in book is Maps of Antietam, if you're not familiar with this and you want to get in the weeds about where units were. Part of our intent with these books is to supply the maps so that if you're an aficionado like I am, I can take this and I can take the photo 
And I can get real close to where that person was on the battlefield and stand in the same general area and think about what he was seeing 160 plus years ago or maybe not seeing because of the smoke. Fox's Gap is the first gap. Um, unfortunately, you did something that I would, as an engineer, drives me crazy. You put north that way. <laughs> and north is that way. <laughs> as a it's map person. Map <laughs> I'm sorry, and you're rotating. That. <laughs> okay, so we will be talking about several soldiers who were in regiments in here 51st. Let's see, what else is in there? 45th. Yeah, 21st Mass, etc. Ohio, 9th Corps units, 17th Michigan. You want to go? So the first one I'm going to show you is a high-ranking guy, Lieutenant Colonel. When I get an image like this, I do research. I pull the guy's service records. I look at the regimental history. You look at the ORs to find out what you can find out. Uh, there's a really useful website now that's been in existence for a while called Find a Grave, where there's a lot of things documented. So this is the typical kind of information that we are able to pull. Note he's wounded early. So he's a blacksmith before the war, commissioned in 61. Struck in the leg by a bullet which was broken, and badly splintered the bone cost him long years of suffering. That's in the regimental history. That's the way they described his wound. It's interesting that the actual record, though, described it as leg broken. Slight. <laughs> but he was still suffering with this wound well after the war. Right. Promoted to major. Returns to the unit September the 8th. Think about that. Six days later, it's madhouse. Makes lieutenant colonel just before the battle. And obviously, this leg wound, which was slight, causes him to resign slightly after the Battle of Antietam in Fredericksburg. But he joined the Customs Service. Lived until 1910, and he's buried in Massachusetts. This is the kind of information you'll find, obviously, written up more as a text in our book for 30 soldiers. And this is his image. One of the best mustaches we have. <laughs> so there's, for example, the ad I was talking about. This one's really nice because there was some information here about February the 8th when he got wounded. And it's signed. He probably didn't write that. Would be my guess. Somebody else wrote it. It says... Wounded at the Battle of Roanoke Island, February the 8th, 1862. One of the things that you learn, you get used to after you do this a while, is handwriting. Some of it in 1860s is really good, and some of it is not so good. I have been asked to transcribe some letters. I'm assisting another historian with transcripts of letters, and I'm looking at the little Two letters written by Lafayette McClaws, if you're familiar with that name, Confederate Major General. And I'm reading about every third word. <laughs> read a little bit, put it down, read again, put it down. Maybe in another two weeks I'll have the letter. Anyway, next slide. First Surgeon, Hiram Simpson, from Michigan, obviously. Mustered in in August of 62. Think about that. August the 16th, I got one month, and then I'm going to be in combat. Hmm. Got paid $25 bounty, pretty good amount of money, and a premium of $2 a month on his pay, because he was a sergeant. Promoted to first sergeant, wounded in action at South Mountain, obviously gets absent for a while, returns to the regiment, Sent to a hospital in Knoxville. Really got sick and also got demoted, probably because they couldn't afford not to have a first sergeant in the regiment, and mustered out in 65. And good old federal government noticed, 
POS was paid in December of 64, and he's mustering out in June of 65. Army's only six months behind on his pay. <clears throat> but he was getting $75 a bounty that they hadn't played him with. After the war, he went into, this is some of the information you sometimes now find on Find a Grave, that he was in flower raising, computed in Michigan State Fair, passed away in 1873, buried up in Grass Lake, Michigan. And then his mother, not his widow, his mother got a survivor's pension. I've actually visited Hiram's grave. It's not too terribly far from where I grew up in Michigan. And so I was able to find the cemetery and, and the site of his burial. And Joe's absolutely right in regards to his post-war career. What has also been extremely helpful with researching these guys after the war is the newspaper accounts. And there are multiple accounts of him winning We, let's take a look at it. With, regarding the pension for the mother, did she have to prove some kind of need to get that because the, the mother was only yeah. in line for it? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, not sole support or something like that. Sole support or yeah. uh, a survivor's pension if he doesn't have a wife or children or anything like that. So yeah. Exactly. Since that was 1884, my suspicion would be as part of what you're talking about, the criteria, her husband may have passed away at that point. So now she's a single on her own and it's much more needy for the pension. Because you notice he died in 73. So it's 11 years later that she applies for it. So that might be an indication of, you know, she was yeah. not indigent in the sense that she was married, or, but when her husband passes away and she loses her financial support, then she can get a pension. Interesting image, one of the few we have of a civilian coat. Right. Now, exactly, good looking guy. Now, we do think that this image is likely a post-war image as opposed to a beginning of the war. First off, we have his signature and rank, or excuse me, regiment on the back of it. Mm -hmm. So he's likely using this as either a gift or a calling card. Also, we, I did a little bit of research on the photographer himself. Come to find out, he's only active in Adrian, Michigan for a few short years uh, after the Civil War. He's actually gone by 67, I believe. So that helps us really narrow down the scope of when this image was likely taken. A couple of other things on here that tells us that it's after the war, but not right after, is that there is no um, luxury stamp on this. And we'll get into those as we see them in some of these other images. Uh, yep. But basically, there was a tax placed on CDDs late in American Civil War, 1864 to 66, and that tax varied depending on the expense of the image you were purchasing. Okay. All right. Now we're going to jump to Frosttown. We're going to do two individuals in each of the five places. So, Frosttown, what am I going to say? This is the, the one that tends to get ignored by most people. And I will admit, I think part of that is because, although just recently Civil War Trust has started to buy some ground up there, most of this ground up until recently was all in private hands. There was, if you tried to give a tour up there, it was kind of like a gravel road and you could kind of say, over in that field was this, and in that field was that, and that was about all you could do. So we're hoping when the Civil War Trust starts to elaborate, make it a little better, it'll be more accessible. It's primarily the Pennsylvania Reserve units. I harassed Brad about the fact that he only put PA instead of 4th Pennsylvania Reserves. Um, that was a group of regiments that were recruited at the beginning, and Pennsylvania had recruited more than the federal government wanted, but the state of Pennsylvania kept them and called them their reserve units. And they were very proud of that, so they called themselves the Ninth. New York, Pennsylvania Reserves, and a lot of their correspondence, even some of the official stuff, although officially when they got mustered in, they became 30, let's see, a ninth would have been 38th Pennsylvania. So they had two designations, which when you're doing research, also leads to some of the idiosyncrasies is that 
under 38th or is it under 9th Pennsylvania Reserves? And nor can the other direction now. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to ignore that. <laughs> This is an interesting one. One of those stories that you don't, you, you know, it's not going to catch anybody's eye, but it was well written up in, in his service records. He was 25. There is a page sometimes in the service record that's called the company descriptive book, and it gives you how tall the guy is, his hair, his eyes, his complexion, and sometimes his occupation. In his case, he said he was a clerk, and how old you were. He's a notice. He's elected first surgeon. See, this is early in the war still when they're electing things. They're not being necessarily appointed. Got sick, spent some time in a hospital in D.C. Came back in time for the Battle of South Mountain. Got through that in good shape. Gets to Antietam. And for those of you who know the Pennsylvania Reserves, they're on the north edge of the cornfield. And there was a fence there. Jumping at a fence at the Battle of Antietam causing aneurysm of the popliteal artery since obliterated injury to the tendon of the exterior muscles of the thigh. Blew his knee out. Yeah. And they didn't have ACL surgery in 1862. So he lives with it for a while. You can see he spends a fair amount of time in a hospital in Washington, D.C. They gave him a little easier job in one context. They made him the quartermaster, which probably meant he got to ride in the wagon most of the time. He didn't have to march. Came back to the regiment. And he's there until now when he mustered in, a lot of these units were enlisting for three years. So you'll notice the date he went in in 61. And in June of 64, he's saying, my three years are up. I'm going home, guys. And again, uh, <clears throat> last paid in February, and it's June. After the war, because they didn't cost anything, good old Uncle Sam went back and gave a lot of people what they call brevet promotions, which says you did something really good, so you, which really meant when you got together at your reunion, if you wanted to spend the money, you could wear a fancier uniform. That's what the <laughs> gallant meritorious service in the wilderness campaign. Filed for a pension in 1888. Lived a long time, 1920. He did good. And there he is. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this photo, unless you want to say this, is right there. Notice how shiny that is. That's got a rain cover on it. That's an oil skin. Don't see that most of the time. And of course, the famous, I'll put my hand in my pocket, a la Napoleon Bonaparte. Is that a raincoat? Well, this is just a cover for his hat. But yeah, there was a, a full, went almost to, didn't go to your ankles, it went to mid, about the knees. About the knees. It was a rain, you yeah, know, slick, probably. Yeah. Yeah. One of the other things of that, because this oh. is a full standing image, uh, one of the other things that's kind of interesting to see here is this device that appears to be hiding behind him. Okay? This is the base or the feet of a brace that is actually coming up behind him and is helping to hold his head steady. Now, a lot of us think that the CEVs took a long time to take. They actually didn't. However, they still wanted to have you as still as possible. And if you have something to brace your head on, that's going to make sure that your face is as clear as possible. And that's exactly what we have going on here, is that we've got a face that he is actually braced against, probably somewhere just behind his neck. It's a rod. Yep. That's exactly right. He's got a rod that they have lined his leg up to cover, and it's sitting right behind him. But you'll oftentimes see um, big old decorative drapes covering up the base of these. Uh, sometimes you'll have a fancy chair that has a brace built into it, so they're kind of sitting back, real proper, uh, good 
uh, oh, posture. Posture, thank you. <laughs> um, but they're always trying to make him as still as possible. Not because they have to be sitting there a long time, but just be, uh, for the clarity of the image. I guess just to your point, um, when in this picture, he was by then not in the Pennsylvania Reserves. Was he promoted after? No, he's still in the Pennsylvania Reserves. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, but he got promoted in his service. So he's wearing, he's wearing the single bar of a first lieutenant. He's not wearing... But the point is, by this time, he was, he was in the Federal Army, so he really would have been the, the, the 30-something. Well, it's the same unit, they just... Yeah, so in the, which, to your point, he still marks his tobacco as being in the... Pennsylvania Reserves. Exactly yeah. Right. But notice what he did to show... What, Part of what you're saying, he's added veteran. Oh, veteran, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what they reserve for. All set? Yep. Uh, one of Joe's favorites. <laughs> How much harassment do you think this guy got for that last name? But they had Grimm's Fairy Tales, which is where that's from. And that's his hometown. Because he's originally born in Germany. Hamburg. Immigrated to the United States. Can you imagine him coming through Ellis Island, speaking German? When I first got this, I thought this was some guy, at the clerk, who was having a, a good time with him. But that's actually his name in German. We found his brother who came and got some stuff, and he signed it, you know, in German, Snow White. So that was his name back in Germany. Yeah. 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 As Joe was saying, after he passes away, when Ernest passes away in uh, Ohio, it's his brother that comes to collect his effects, and he signed the ledger. He gets wounded at, at uh, Antietam. Again, he's one of these people he went in. Interesting, he's a distiller. Hmm, interesting. He's a sergeant initially. He's going to get promoted to second lieutenant. And then he's commanding the company, promoted to first lieutenant. Missing in action. He was actually reported as a deserter for one month because they didn't know for sure what had happened to him. Returns to the federal side in 65 when he gets paroled. And he basically said, that's enough, I'm going home. March the 12 days, 11 days later. Breveted captain for gallant conduct at the wilderness. Filed for a pension in 1877. And was living in Dayton, Ohio, where he passed away in 1902. Yeah. Uh, he's actually a book binder for a little while after the war. We found some advertising and whatnot in Ohio, some of the Ohio papers that it's listing him as a book binder and seller. An interesting individual for sure. Yeah, so he said he was missing in action during the Battle of the Wilderness. Yep. And then he was promoted to a captain for his conduct. At the yep. So he must have. Doc. They didn't know where he was. He was lost and then he came back and told them what he did. Yeah. Well, and I. Exchange and the rest of the company may have been saying, you know, this guy was really good. We saw him fall in the field, etc. No idea where he was Didn't show Actually, anything. Um, I believe we do talk about that in the book. I'm pretty sure he's at camp. Asylum. Uh, asylum. That's what I was going to say. But beautiful image of him in a seated pose. Again, we've got a chair here to help kind of just brace himself a little bit to keep his as still as possible, and we have a really elaborate advertisement on the back. Now, we've mentioned earlier about the tax stamps or luxury uh, taxes. That's what this is. That two-cent stamp there is actually a luxury 
tax on this image. So we know this image was likely taken between 1854 and 1866. Of course, he is captured at the beginning of 64, and then he's not released until 65, so this is likely taken at the very end of his service. And it's as a first lieutenant, which, if you remember, was the last promotion he got during the war, so it's late. Is that a federal tax? Or yes, a state? it's a federal. If, it, if the image was 25 cents or less, it's a two cent stamp. If it's 25 cents to 50 cents, it's a three cent stamp. If it's more than that, five then cents. five cents. Yeah. I think the most expensive that you saw of these was a dollar. And again, you're, you're getting a group of them for a dollar, and then it would be a five cent tax. Yeah. They were supposed to, you can see the initials kind of, they were supposed to cancel it. Legally, they were supposed to write the date there which unfortunately most of the time they don't do, or it's a scribble and you can't read it. We would love to have more dates because it would give us a, another clue of the dating of the photography. Do you think that was levied just because the government needed money? Yep. They were desperate. Yep. Yep. And these were becoming so popular and folks were getting so many of them, it was an easy thing to tax because it wasn't just the military images they were taxing. They were taxing CDs. Every, period. Everybody knows Turner's Gap. Which way did you put north this time? <laughs> it should be actually north. <laughs> I think this one is north because that's the road going up. Yeah. <laughs> There's the mountain house, which is still there. We all drive by it. First Corps, Phelps's Brigade down here. Shall I, have, shall I cite Tom Clements? <laughs> Most people are familiar with that brigade. Western Iron Brigade. What most people don't realize is this brigade also called themselves the Iron Brigade before the Western guys. And then there's another brigade that called themselves the Iron Brigade. Iron Brigade was a popular terminology. So, yeah. Supposedly they got their nickname Iron Brigade for their ability, their marching on the Peninsula Campaign. This Iron Brigade is supposedly comes from here. Supposedly Joseph Hooker. So, next slide. Thought we'd change subjects, and we did hit an Irishman. <laughs> Although I don't think that name is very Irish, but. <laughs> A surgeon. Surgeons, assistant surgeons were lieutenants and captains. When you made full surgeon, theoretically you were supposed to be made a major. Didn't always happen, but he was successful at that. 28 years old. Early in the war, a lot of the forms show a guy's status as not stated, which means they didn't fill in the blank to say that he was present. Doesn't mean he wasn't present, you just don't know for sure. But starting in January, February 62, I think somebody stomped on people or there was a general order, hey guys, make sure to fill that out. So then present becomes much more common. Made surgeon of the 23rd. Now the 23rd New York was one of the early units recruited. And a number of those units early in the war, especially in New York, signed up for two years, not three, which is what most of what we see. So he musters out May 63. Where you may have run across this is just before the Battle of Gettysburg, Joseph Hooker, who's in command of the Army of the Potomac, is complaining about all the veterans that are going home. That's these two-year regiments, a lot of them from New York. Again, May, February pay. Uh, a lot of the guys in these two-year regiments waited a little while. They muster out in May. They'd been infantry, and they decided, you know, I'm going to go back in, but I'm going to go in as a cavalryman so I can ride. So there's a whole bunch of my, you look at the roster of the 20th New York Cavalry, and you find a whole bunch of guys who have previous service in the 22nd, the 31st, the 20th, etc. 
and he served until the end of the war. Went back to private practice, still listed as a physician, passed away in 1889, and he's buried in Pennsylvania. Medical officer. As a uh, major, notice how, look how hard he's pushing down on that table. You see his knuckles there. That is not a medical officer's sword, though, which probably means that's a prop from the photographer. He said, I want to put this on the table while you're standing there. We see this quite a bit in these images. Uh, props or sometimes gear that the photographers have, they're trying to make the image look a little bit more dynamic. Um, and you will see guys that seem to have coats that are just a little too big for them or too small for them. And absolutely, those could be uh, their issued gear, but they also could be just a prop that the photographer had as well. There's This particular one isn't it, but we have one where the hat looks huge on the guy. So we have to wonder, is that actually his hat or is it just something the photographer said, hey, why don't you hold on to this while you take the image? Now, here's a trivia question for you. Lots of you have heard of Matthew Brady, right? Did you know he never took a picture in the Civil War? His assistants did it, because he was blind. That's why there's a whole bunch of photos taken in 64 when they're down on the peninsula of kind of outdoor scenes. He's standing in the scenes. He's got a white coat on. He's very prominent, usually off on the side, because he couldn't focus the camera unfortunately, for him. Next? Unless you got something else you want to say. Yeah, point out, we've also, not only do we have a standing image here, but we're also seeing a higher ranking officer's image. The double rows of two buttons is almost always uh, the higher ranking officers in a regiment. In this case, two rows of seven would be your majors, lieutenant colonels, and colonels of a regiment. And then, of course, we have the very dark shoulder boards as well meaning that those are staff officer, or in this case, command officers, as opposed to the Company. actual coloration that would be inside those. As most of you guys know, the Civil War is color-coded. We have light blue for the infantry, red for the artillery, and yellow for cavalry. That can be hard to pick out on a black and white image, but you do see, when we're talking about infantry officers, oftentimes the interior of these rank boards will be very light color because it's light blue. Still color. I figured it still was. <laughs> Captain Bradley, 29 years old, 105th New York, elected, notice that again, early war, January 62, made captain, yeah. Wounded at Antietam. Official record says he's noted his gallant service during the Maryland campaign. Went home until February of 63. Um, this regiment, as you can see in March, is consolidated with the 94th New York. Um, there's a story there. I'm not sure what it is. Need to do some research about that, some suspicions about how well they had fought. Um, when that consolidation took place, now we got more officers than we need, so he was declared extra, mustered out two days later, and he hadn't been paid since October. He did file for a pension in 1877 and passed away in 1888, and we couldn't find his gravestone. Yep. And this is one where, as Matt said earlier, it looks like he was giving this as a gift to somebody because he wrote compliments of at the top of it. Typical officer's uniform, bugle up there. Notice how they've kind of shrouded that brace again. Can't figure out what that is right there. Basically what we have here is he doesn't have his sword attached, 
Yes. And these are the saber slings. And that will be holding uh, the sword. Yep. And a really nice image showing the belt and whatnot. We go into some detail about what the belt plate could have on it. Sometimes these images are so clear that you can actually almost read the, the belt buckles and things. Read the numbers on the hat. Numbers on the hat, exactly. Other times, they're not as clear. In this case, there's a little bit of uh, fuzz. fuzz due to the overhead. Yep. Okay. Crampton's Gap. I live in Keysville, so this is down near me. Hey, well, it's almost north. Late afternoon, a couple of brigades from the 6th Corps. For those of you who've been there, you know this, this stone wall is still there. That road is there. And uh, Burkittsville is right down here. So, next slide. Oh, one of my favorite photos. Sergeant Aikens, Vermont. A farmer, lots of farmers. Five foot five and a half inches tall, blue eyes, light hair. Came in as a private. He had served in one of the three-month units at the beginning of the war. He's present, promoted to corporal sometime in that period. Exact date, not on his records. Makes sergeant, then makes first sergeant with a note he'd been paid as a third sergeant. Re-enlisted in Late fall of 63, the Federal Army realized there was a whole bunch of guys that might be going home in the spring of 64, so they set up a re-enlistment bonus. You got a 30-day furlough, or 39 or 28, it varied a little bit by state. <clears throat> when he had re-enlisted, of course, they do a re-evaluation of all his status, and there's a note on his form that he had drawn $18.91 against his clothing allowance. May have had to do with his promotions. Got sick at Brandy Station, promoted to first lieutenant, and transferred to a different company. Makes company uh, captain, goes to another company. Wounded in the thigh at Battle of Cedar Creek, October 64. Obviously was invalid because he's discharged in March of 65. Lived in Vermont after the war and passed away in 1924. Now, this is the kind of foe I wish they all were. As a first sergeant, cravat, sergeant stripes, veteran stripe. You can actually see a little bit of his shoes. There's a stripe on his pants leg. A little bit of a collar for his shirt. And he signed it as first sergeant. Company D, 4th Vermont, looking straight at you. Fantastic image. Um, not only is he seated and bracing himself on the table, but again, we do have a bit of the base of that brace is behind the chair. So there's, even though he's got that table to kind of lean against, they're still making sure he's as still as possible. But no, it's a fantastic image. January of 63. No. Now, that's, I'm guessing that is his coat. Uh, but yep. yep, still wearing the still wearing full frock in 63. Now, he is promoted in January of 63, so he might be keeping the larger coat because it is winter. <laughs> but uh, what Ken is hinting at is that a lot of these guys are divesting themselves of the coat, the long formal coat as the war progresses. And you'll start seeing lighter jackets, things that are easier to maintain in the field as the war goes on. But in this case, we still have the full frock in 63. Okay. Oh, one of the sad stories. Major George Lemon, 1822. He's one of the older guys. Veteran of the Mexican War. Involved in California politics following the admittance to statehood. 45 years old, musters into as a major in the 32nd New York. Started at present, 
severely wounded in the left thigh at Crampton's Camp. Went to the hospital in Burkittsville for treatment. They thought he was going to be survive. So on October 23rd, while he's still there, they promoted him to Lieutenant Colonel. However, as you can read, his wound started to bleed. And eventually on November 10th, 1862, he passed away in Burkittsville. They had amputated his leg on the 9th and then probably the combination of the bleeding and the shock was just too much. And his case is actually documented in the medical and surgical history of the Civil War. So it's a big, I think it's a six volume set looking at all the different medical cases of the war. Um, his was interestingly interesting enough to the surgeons that they actually documented his case and that was extremely helpful when researching it. But his son, isn't it? Yep. Comes in him. Yep. And they noted in his obituary that when he was buried, he requested they be buried in his full uniform in his army blanket. So I wonder why the Nick took that role as a trustee here then. It's a good question. And I not being a, a medical man myself, I couldn't necessarily tell you. I wonder if perhaps it started to heal and then something reopened there. Yeah. yeah. An older gentleman from what we've been seeing. Now this is, somebody's added this, you can see the, the name there. You see this quite a bit too when it comes to collecting CDVs. Previous collectors will write down the information on the guy. On the or the person who got it yeah. may have documented, which <laughs> I keep reminding myself I need to go do with some of the photos I have taken. I'm looking at it and saying, when was that taken? Hmm. So. $150? Yes. <laughs> uh, somebody has a price on there at some point. Yep. Now, this particular image, again, we have an officer's uh, frock, two rows of seven buttons. But what's particularly interesting is here around the collar. This is likely a paper collar, something that was very common at the time. You would actually, as opposed to having a folding collar, as most shirts do today, you would have a paper collar that would button on. It would give you a nice, crisp, clean collar, and then they could just throw that away as opposed to trying to keep these collars clean, as many of us gentlemen uh, struggle with. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hancock, superb. Always known for having a white collar, yes. white cl paper collar. <laughs> One of the side tidbits. Okay. But we're going to move down to our last area that we covered in the book. Of course, Harper's Ferry and the ongoing actions there. And yes, the map is not facing north. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the little arrow. Yeah, the oh, they hit it on me. Huh. Oh. Oh. Brad's maps. Yes, I know. But what, what this does show very well, besides the units we're interested in, is look at where the Confederate artillery is. And of course, then there's a whole bunch of Confederate artillery over here that doesn't show on the map. There's some of it right there. You know, they talk about being in the middle of a bowl and the artillery coming from every which way. So you want to go to the next one? Charles Jarvis, 9th Vermont, a farmer. He came in, since he raised the company, he got to be the captain. July 9th, becomes a prisoner of war, September 15th. Like all, all most of those guys, he's sent to Camp Douglas near Chicago, Illinois, where they're going to sit till March. Um, he may have had it a little better because he was an officer because they separated the officers from the enlisted men. Shortly after he returned, they promoted him to major, got sent back to Vermont on recruiting duty, came back September, just in time to get killed. Conical ball from a coal Navy revolver, according to the surgeon. Buried in Vermont. This, when it comes to Jarvis, let's pull up his image right now. I like, not only is it 
a, a great image, but the story behind him reminds us that these men were not dying in camp sick all the time. They weren't dying in massive epic struggle. Struggle, excuse me. Sometimes it's just some stupid random skirmish that gets you killed, and that's sadly what happens with his arms. Yep. Probably had the, had this photo taken when he was sent home on rec recruiting duty because this photographer's in Boston because it doesn't have the stamp and of course he passed away before they became mandatory. Full standing view. Now here's the other trick the photographers did. A lot of times they didn't want you to see that little stand. So notice where they end the photo down there. So you can't see the guy's shoes. Fancy buttons. some of the images we have where it's actually got, say, the Massachusetts seal on the buttons, and then it'll have this additional ring. Or right. the New York state seal, and the two-year regiments were uh, well known for having these New York buttons on there. Yeah, partly because you got to remember, a lot of these guys are coming in with militia stuff. Right. Okay, next slide. Interesting first name. Farmer, 126 New York, went in on August 22nd, and less than 30 days later, he's a POW at Harper's Ferry. 5'9", fair complexion, hazel eyes, light hair. Promoted to fifth sergeant. He's one of these up and down guys. Notice he went in as a first sergeant, but when they were up in New York City, he got demoted to private. But sometime while they're still, he's back up as sergeant again. Now he's a clerk in brigade headquarters as a third sergeant. Went from fifth to third. Promoted to the officer's ranks. August the 3rd as a second lieutenant. And less than a year later, he's wounded at Cole Harbor. Sent to a hospital in Baltimore. One of the things that the good old Uncle Sam did is if they sent you to a hospital, a military hospital back someplace, and you rode the military railroad, they docked your pay for your transportation. I've seen guys where they were docked $9.22 being shipped from out west to the east coast. Mustered out on Christmas Day, 1864. Look at that. December 64, and he hadn't been paid since February. Plus, he was due a bounty. Filed for a pension, passed away in 1889. He's actually buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Yeah. Kind of a casual looking guy. Alexandria, Virginia. Nice signature. Notice the F is the middle. It caused me some problems when I was first trying to find this guy because everything was Fayette and I kept looking for Fayette and I couldn't find it because his first name is, starts with a B. I don't think we ever did find it, did we? No, we, no record shows what that B stands for. What's interesting about this image, other than it is, as Joe said, a very casual looking image. This is obviously a sergeant and then private and then sergeant again who didn't really care about <laughs> Yep. Right here, the piping on infantry coats would match the color of the branch of service, in this case, light blue. Interestingly enough, they only really did it around the uh, collar. They didn't do it down here on the piping on the cuffs. He is a private in this particular image, correct? But he's probably he's already been a sergeant at least once at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder if he's had them stripes on and taking them off and putting them back on again. <laughs> okay. Right. We do thank you for uh, the presentation this evening. And if anyone has any questions, I'm sure Joe has got some time to answer those.
sure. How did you show that the last day, let's say he got buried in an Arlington cemetery, how did they decide he got buried there he did? Did they really proceed to that or did they just... I don't think so. I've never seen anything. Today, of course, there's all kinds of criteria, but back in those days, it may have been, may have been where his family was. Um, Arlington, of course, is the first national cemetery, and the national cemetery system gets started immediately after the Civil War. Right. So he may have said, okay, national cemetery, I have a claim for having served the country, and I want to be buried there. That's the first one. It could have been something as simple as that. But we don't, unfortunately, we don't have any documentation as to the specific reason why. One of the... Uh, when we had the last big an the 150th anniversary at Antietam, and then we had the 150th of the cemetery, which was 1867. And so they did a lot of research in that. And one of the things they discovered, here's one of these stories, they discovered back in the back corner in the National Cemetery at Antietam, there is a U.S. Marine. And he was killed in the Boxer Rebellion. And when they started researching him, they determined he, he was not married, all his family was dead. So why did his body get shipped from China to Sharpsburg? Because they couldn't find any rationale. They finally found, I don't remember who it was, if not, I don't think it was you Keith, know. that if I remember exactly correct, his nearest living relative was a woman, second cousin, who was living in Boonesboro. So they brought the body back to bury him close to the nearest living relative. We, that was a, for about six months, it was, everybody was scratching their head, why is this Marine at Antietam who's Kill, you know, there's a lot of cemeteries between China and, <laughs> and us, you know, why not? Because there was no record of him, you know, having a widow's pension or family survivors or family or anything. So why, why would they move him all the way across the country? He's one of the guys that we didn't find a find a grave. Right. Well, we found a grave, but it's... Yep. Yeah. yeah. He may have requested it. Yeah. This is a file for pension in whatever it was, and then he died six years later. Um, does that imply that he received his pension? Yes. Because what one of the things you can research is... There, there is a what's called the pension file index cards. So it's a, it's a standard card that was, they were filled out later on, obviously. But all the records, the pension records, are kept under a number that was given to you when you filed for a pension. They assigned a number. So the index cards have those numbers. So for example, there's usually, it's a standard form and it says invalid, widow, uh, surviving children, doesn't say mother. Mother's usually written in. Dependent. Dependent. So there's about four rows there, and then there's some blanks. And then it's got the certificate numbers. So if, in his case, on that date, he was assigned, and there's two numbers there, which means he got a pension. And then at the bottom, uh, probably about 40% of the time is the date of death, and about half the time, the location. So it'll have a note at the bottom that says, passed away on April 3rd, 1922, at Staten Island, for example. I'm, I just made that up. But, so, but more than half the time, that's not there. All it's on, the, you see, is stamped in the corner, it said, uh, he's dead. So they stopped paying a pension for some reason. Maybe the checks came back. Just ensuring that he applied for it usually implies that he died. Yeah. In, the, in this case, yeah. Because that means there's a number. Yeah. When you're doing this uh, research, is it in paper or is it in microfiche? It's paper. Paper. 
Yep. Where are these people at? DC or? National Archives. The Civil War records are. Now, the, the, the thing that drives us crazy is the fact that I don't know when, a number, long time ago, I'm going to use that terminology, the records for the regulars were taken from the National Archives. They were sent to the branch archives in St. Louis, where, if you remember, in the 1970s, they had a big fire. And all those records were destroyed. So we can, do not have the month-by-month, bi-monthly reports that we do for the volunteers, for the regulars. Usually you have an enlistment date, sometimes you have a muster-out date, and that's about all they have, is a log book. <laughs> and I've looked at it, and it's, and it's by date. So you're kind of guessing, well, I think he went in in July of 61. So you only have July... And it's, you know, you, well, it's alphabetical by month, and it's it's a pain. Never mind. I have yes. A question about Charlestown Gap. Yes. Was that gap ever? Was there a road that actually ran from the gap down the mountain to? Why don't you go back to the map? Sure. Well, it's it's also called the plateau. So sometimes it's referred to as the plateau, and sometimes it's referred to as the gap. So north is this way. Point to it on the map. Where is it? Charlestown Gap. It's right here. Right here. Yeah, there's a big cleft in the mountain there. That's the gap or plateau. But a road does run through it. What is today called Dolbrin Road. That runs right alongside it. Got it. Yeah. So, so that, that gap was probably used to some extent in commerce or whatever. Yep. Sure. And then it was used during the battle too. Yeah. Now it's, it's closed off in private property. Well, this road is there. You can you can drive it if you wish. Uh, it's but I do recommend having a vehicle that can do some fairly steep. Uh, I think right about isn't it right about there? From about here to there, is yeah. gravel road. Right. Okay. So it's and I've been up. Well, I was up there one time after we'd had a couple of big thunderstorms and that gravel road was not in the best condition and who knows when, you know, erosion is. And as I said, a lot of this ground, almost all of this, used to be in private property. It was the, the, the Maryland State thing is back up in there, you know, that Maryland State Park up there. You can kind of see the the, the hash marks of the high ground right in here. So you can see the slope right across there, the terrain features, so you can see how it's going up. Yeah, it's, it really, if you do have a chance to go up across town, you can view it via the road, uh, and it does give you a real appreciation for how difficult that terrain is. Uh, the Confederates are heavily outnumbered, of course, at the Battle of South Mountain at all the gaps. But they only have to guard those gaps, and they're doing a real good job of it through most of September 14th. And the terrain is the big reason mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. That and all these stone fences that just yeah, crisscross. Yeah. 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 If you're going to go there, I would go now. <laughs> yeah. Don't wait till July, because if you go in July, you can't see anything because of the trees. Good point. The sight, the sight lines are almost, except for there's a couple of small fields up there. Alternate 40. Yes, alternate 40 it does. Alternate 40 near the... Uh, yeah, the Dahlgren Church up there. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go down to Boulevard, if you're heading for South Mountain on alternate 40, take a right at Boulevard, you'll go out to Crosstown, you can pick up the Dahlgren Road there. Or you can go up to the top of Turner's Gap, almost to the top of Turner's Gap, and pick up the Dahlgren Road that way. Ken, you got a question? Yes, yeah, so the photography Images, yeah. It made me think while you were showing that. So, if let's say, well, she talked about the grave has the New York written on it. Yeah. But that is the question. That doesn't necessarily mean the photograph was taken in New York, right? The grave could send photographers to you. Is that, is that a fair? Well, in that case, 
most of those, I'll come back to that. Um, now, Brady had two big studios, one in Washington, D.C., and one in New York. So the ad was for both most of the time. What you sometimes find on Brady images, and I don't think that one had it, in the lower front corner, one in the corner of the other, it will either have Washington or New York, which implies that's the studio that took that photo. Now, there were photographers who had agreements with individual regiments. And so they, would, they were authorized to take their photographic equipment and camp with the regiment for some period of time. And there are some back marks, as we call them, on the back side where you know, the guy says, photographer for the 46th Pennsylvania, you know, taken in, effectively it's taken in the field. You know, he took his equipment in and took pictures. Does that mark say that? Yeah, it says 46th Pennsylvania Regiment. Reg, um, Cooley is a well-known photographer. He took, was the photographer for the 10th Corps. And so his back mark is photographer for the 10th Corps. And it's some, is it Columbus, South Carolina? It was down south. Yes. Now the 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 caveat on that is for these kind of photos that we're showing, yes, you're probably right ninety-five percent of the time. If it's a picture of a well known individual, Joseph Hooker, for example, the photographers some of them were I'm not sure what term I'd use, pirates. So they would buy an image taken by Brady, and they would then take pictures of that picture and put their own back mark on it, okay? So sometimes you can detect that because you can tell a photo of a photo of a photo, and it goes through about three iterations, you know, you know, that's, or you sometimes get, you see that sometimes with, not surprisingly, a photographer in Toledo, Ohio, and he's showing, and he's got images of Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. He obviously didn't, you know, he's bought something and has taken pictures of a picture so he can sell them because photos of Robert E. Lee were popular and he could sell them and make a profit. So the, the, the general officers, famous people, William Booth, Abraham Lincoln, you know, William Seward, those kind of things, you not infrequently you'll see a photo of Abraham Lincoln and it's got a back mark of Chicago, you know, which makes sense. But if you look at it, you say, that's the Alexander Gardner photo taken, you know, that's used on your $5 bill, you know, taken in 1864 here. And you know, it's a photo of a photo of a photo kind of thing. So there is a, there is a bit of a possibility that it's not, especially if it's a small town and it's somebody Ulysses S. Grant? No, probably never there. But if it's, you know, of Private John Smith, he was probably there, you know, because that's a first. And as you, I would, I would say of the photos we showed here, these are all first shot, so to speak. They're taken from life. Those, there's no photos of photos of photos in that, that session. I don't think there's any in the book, for that matter, because we don't have any fancy high-ranking people. Yes. You had one of those that said $150 at the top. So there's probably still being sold now. Are, are they like baseball cards? You get a top player or you get a top general, you get more money from them? And are they still available? Oh, yeah. In fact, I just spent a fair amount of money <laughs> on Sunday. <laughs> the prices have gone up like everything else. When I started collecting these in, say, 1982 or 83, and I started, like a lot of people, I started collecting some general officers. And, you know, you could buy a nice image of Joseph Hooker or George McClellan for $35. Now, the nice one, 300 bucks maybe. Right. Uh, and then the really fancy ones like the, the 300 and 
Yeah. And yeah. as you... Well, and what drives us crazy in a different context, but we have to deal with it is, um, not surprisingly, if the individual, regardless of name and rank, but if he's identified and it's verified, and he's KIA or wounded in action at Gettysburg, forget it, you know, you're talking 500 bucks or more, okay? So it all depends on and some